You know, I don't know what it is we don't understand in medicine. These pathologists do autopsies on 21 dead people, right? This isn't in this country. And they find that of the 21, 11 died of Alzheimer's. So of that 21, how many do you think they found fungus in, okay? Stay tuned, it's really fascinating. Dr. Ann Louise Gittleman, New York Times bestseller list, is here with us today. The new fat flush, what has she learned? She is awesome, I love spending time with her. And then finally today, chicken meatballs. How does that sound? You know, we have a diet named after me, the Kaufman diet, and chicken meatballs is on our phase one Kaufman diet. All that, and I promise you, a whole lot of learning on today's Know the Cause. My name is Doug Kaufman. For the past 40 years, I've dedicated my life and even my career to finding the root cause of disease. Join me and a team of physicians, pharmacists, and scientists, and soon you too will know the cause. Well, you saw as we bumped in there, you saw Dr. Ann Louise Gittleman. She and I go back way too many years. We've been <laughs> friends for a long, long time since I read an article in a medical magazine many, many years ago where she was questioning our sickness in avoiding fats. She was saying that's not the answer. Don't stay away from fats. They're bad fats. Stay away from them. Here they are, and they're good. This is 30, 40 years ago, and I'm thinking she's so right. And by the way, she's shaking her finger at grains. I don't think at that time you knew about mycotoxins in grains or things of that sort, but you were dead on. Most of our audience is female. Probably 62, 65% of the audience is female. Uh, other 45 or you know 40%. Uh, being males, uh, talk, uh, brand new book, The New Fat Flush Plan. The Fat Flush pl uh, Plan became a runaway New York Times bestseller a few years ago, and here she is back with us, Dr. Ann Louise Gittleman, talking about what she has learned in the past three or four years in revising this Fat Flush Plan. Uh, and I especially love the fact that you have a three-day jump start for women, but go ahead, I'm in the way, you talk. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something interesting, because over the years, women have come to me because at a certain age and stage, they can't lose weight, Doug. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the perimenopausal, they get to their 40s and 50s, and things slow down. I mean, I see it at my age as well. What we learn is that if you have your gallbladder out, it affects the thyroid. Wow. That is major. There's some really interesting research from Finland that we discovered, even Harvard, that suggests that having the gallbladder out will slow down the thyroid and is kind of a precursor to hypothyroidism. We think it has something to do with the timing of the bile, and there's something about bile which impacts the T4's ability, the inactive thyroid, to change into T3, the activated thyroid hormone that the thyroid produces. So that means that you have to get your bile in order so that you can lose weight. So for people that don't have a thyroid, it means that you need you some... You need a gallbladder, right? Oh, that don't yeah. have a... And sometimes people lose their thyroid as exactly. well, but they know what to do with that. Similar to if you don't have a gallbladder, you need the same kind of support. Yep. So you need a support, whether it's ox bile, choline, inositol, lecithin. There's a whole slew of nutrients that help you be able to produce what your body natively is missing, at least in a timed fashion. And if you have sluggish thyroid or a sluggish system, you need to qualify and quantify the bile by thinning it out. And you thin it out by certain drinks that we talk about, detoxifying drinks or lecithin and the same kind of nutrients. You know, it's so fascinating to me we almost have this cavalier attitude. Um, many women watching this right now, many men, don't have gallbladders. They've been to their doctor and say, well, I got a little problem here and I you know, have these problems. Boom, gallbladder gone. Just like when we were kids, boom, tonsils gone. Or women, boom, uterus gone. What is it, what is it in the gallbladder if it's there that can still negatively impact the thyroid. We're sluggish, right? The gallbladder doesn't work. Correct. And so we're looking here, thyroid, parathyroid, 
Few doctors look at the gallbladder as the etiology, as the root cause of what might be wrong with this. Well, we've just discovered this. It's really interesting. It impacts metabolism by at least seven times. So you can lose your ability to metabolize and you become sluggish and overweight. And it's very frustrating if you think you're doing everything right, which means that you have to get the lecithin, which natively is a part of bile. It's a constituent of bile, okay. which your liver produces on a daily basis. Even if you lose your gallbladder, which is the storage tank for the bile, the liver will still produce the bile, but you need the raw nutrients, the raw materials, to right. make that bile thinned and quality, high quality bile, which can flow freely. It can become congested with all kinds of sludge and gunk, and then hormones cannot be metabolized. And so then you exactly. get the hormone awakening, and everybody becomes, so you gotta look to the bile. You look to the detox drinks that I talk about, lemon and water, hin hin is a clue there, dandelion root tea, Tea, hint, hint, that's a clue, as well as lecithin, which I suggest everybody uses for their smoothies. I suggest sunflower lecithin or non-GMO soy lecithin to the tune of one to two tablespoons a day. Best kind of glutathione if your liver is sluggish? What do you like? Avocado, it's a precursor. <laughs> See, it's just, it, by the way, it's all in a brand new book, the new Fat Flush Plan, written by the author of the original Fat Flush Plan. That's Dr. Ann Louise Gittleman. Amazon.com has this book, inexpensive, brilliant work, but what more should we expect? <laughs> thank you. Uh, from Dr. Ann Louise Gittleman, thank you for coming in today thank and being you. with us. Thank you, folks. We'll be right back. You know, Lindsay goes into the kitchen here at Know the Cause and does a lot of cooking for us. We asked her to make chicken meatballs. Most of us have beef, most of us have lamb. Chicken meatballs, take it away, Lindsay. Hey, I'm Lindsay Crouch. Today we're gonna do braised chicken meatballs with kale and lemon soup. Now I've already got our aromatic sauteed. We have shallots, scallions and garlic already soft and fragrant in our pot and they smell delicious. We're just going to grab this and dump it into our chicken. This is one pound of ground chicken. This is going to make eight meatballs. Just go ahead and combine everything with your hands. I'm going to leave one hand clean so I can season. Just working in those aromatics and the meat. Get everything combined real well. A pinch of black pepper, of sea salt, and let's just pour in all this crushed red pepper and make it real spicy and flavorful. Again, just mix together. And now we're gonna form our meatballs. Since this is about one pound of meat, making eight meatballs, that'd be about two hearty servings. Just grab a little pinch and roll. I'm going to form eight meatballs, and then we're going to get them back into the pot and brown them. Okay guys, we've got our meatballs all brown. They're partially cooked, not completely done. We're gonna finish them off um, here in a minute. But now what we're gonna do is add our lemons to the pot. We're actually gonna cook these lemons because they're gonna become edible. So we're gonna brown them first in with the meatballs. This is one cup, or I'm sorry, one full thinly sliced lemon. We're just gonna throw them in and let them brown. Get in those good juices that we've created with the aromatics and the meatballs. They're gonna take on all that flavor and the meatballs are gonna take on the lemon flavor as well. We're gonna let them get soft and brown. I'm gonna cook these for about two minutes. Our next step is the broth. We're just gonna pour it right in. This is two cups of chicken broth, which has great flavor in itself. Can you imagine how amazing this all is gonna taste? All right, I'm gonna give it one stir Get everything combined here. And we're gonna put the lid on and let these finish cooking. The meatballs are gonna finish cooking now for about eight to 10 minutes. 
Our meatballs are completely cooked now. We've got a great simmer on this broth. The lemons are nice and soft. Now our second to last step is going to be adding in this bunch of kale. We've rinsed it and chopped it up. And now we're just going to let it soften in the broth. It'll only take about a couple minutes. It's going to become a nice bright green color. It's going to add some nice heartiness to this soup. This is a phase one recipe, guys. It's antifungal. It's savory and delicious and so many bold flavors. That's beautiful. It adds some freshness, some color, some brightness to your soup. And these braised meatballs are going to be so yummy. Yum. Okay. The kale is nice and soft and kind of broken down now. And now, for the fun part. We get to put this in our bowl and serve it and enjoy. Okay. Making sure to get broth and meatballs and lemon and kale in every serving. Mmm. Add some more broth. A nice little lemon piece on top. And we're going to garnish with some chopped green onions. And you might season just a little bit more. Black pepper and sea salt. This recipe will be on knowthecods.com. Check it out for this phase one recipe and more. Thanks so much for joining us. You know, I had such good luck with Alzheimer's patients of Dr. David Weekly. Oh, I was there to help them with skin conditions. He was a dermatologist. And once we got psoriasis or seborrheic dermatitis or other problems handled, very often memory would come back. Wait a minute, Diflucan and Nystatin, two antifungal pills helping memory? Could it help Alzheimer's? And what if one of the precursors, one of the risk factors of Alzheimer's disease was surgery? So go with me now down that road because Diane asks a great, great question, okay? We uh, answer Facebook questions from time to time as often as we can. This was Diane's. What can cause Alzheimer's? Oh, the medical community says, we don't know. You know, we don't have any idea what can cause Alzheimer's. This is one cause. Now, mind you, 2015 was a banner year for Alzheimer's. The journal Nature stated that a risk existed in the accidental surgical transmission of Alzheimer's seeds from one patient to another. I'm in surgery for a leg problem, and they give me a pint of blood. Could that pint of blood have been from someone with fungus in their bloodstream? And now I've got it in my bloodstream. Does a surgical risk exist for the passage of Alzheimer's? Look, a ringworm is fungus, and you can pass that from one arm to the other, or one person to another. What about Alzheimer's, okay? The same year. This journal, a month later, the journal Scientific Reports stated the possibility that Alzheimer's disease is a fungal disease or that fungal infections is a risk factor for Alzheimer's opens new perspectives for effective therapy for these patients. Of course, what they're saying, my friends, new drugs, new drugs, new drugs. But if you look at an Alzheimer's patient's diet, pasta and bread, and foods that are high in sugar and so forth. Are they feeding the fungus that was planted by a well-meaning surgeon or may have been planted with antibiotics long time ago? What is Alzheimer's disease? It's interesting as you study some of these diseases, any autoimmune disease, and I do, what you find as you Google search them, we don't know. The American Academy of Allergy and Immunology, we don't know what causes allergy. We don't know what causes asthma. We don't know, but we got drugs. Step right up. And there are more drugs coming out, so don't worry. Folks, I didn't name the show which drug is proper or a second opinion. I named it understand why you have asthma or why you have Alzheimer's, and this is one cause. What causes or cures Alzheimer's disease? Now, I reference these, alzheimersabout.com. Scientists are still, uh, still trying to fully understand the cause or causes of Alzheimer's disease. That's a big we don't know. Here's another one. 
ALZ.org. While scientists know Alzheimer's disease involves progressive brain cell failure, the reason cells fail really isn't clear. That's another, mm, we don't have any idea. We don't know why Alzheimer's here. Are we okay with that? I mean, we go to a doctor for a reason. Look, dad's losing his memory. He can't remember my name. Dad's 75 years old. What is this? Is it senile dementia, right? Is it, is it Alzheimer's? What is it? Blood tests will be taken and so forth. Look at dad's history. Was dad raised in a basement? Was dad sick? Was he on lots and lots of antibiotics for throat infections or inner ear infections when he was five years old? Did dad have a lot of surgery? Because that equals a lot of antibiotics. Why am I implicating antibiotics? Antibiotics are mycotoxins. The mold is called penicillium. The mycotoxin it makes is called penicillin. We've all taken that. And we knew in the 1950s that penicillin was a neurotoxic substance. And yet, step right up. No more candy in the pediatrician's office. From now on, it's antibiotics. Folks were just levied with these antibiotics so incredibly. Here's another one, cdc.gov. Scientists are finding more evidence that some of the risk factors for heart disease and stroke, okay, we're off on Alzheimer's a little bit, but we'll come back, such as hypertension, high cholesterol, statin drugs kill fungus, and low levels of the vitamin folate may also increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. There is no known cure for Alzheimer's disease. Anybody got a big yawn? No known cure for cancer. Oh, you got a lot of plaque in your heart. We don't know about step right up. Have this procedure, balloon angioplasty, have this drug. Folks, they're not bad people. There is no incentive in America for us to know the cause unless you start tracing a little nutrient called folate. What's folate? It's called folic acid, and are they saying that's a risk factor for Alzheimer's and high cholesterol and high blood pressure? That's indeed what they're saying. So when we get back from the short break, Let's dwell a few minutes on what folic acid really is and where do we get it. Don't go away. In the beginning of the show, I talked about 21 autopsies that were done, and in 11 of those autopsies, they found fungus growing in the brain of patients and in other blood vessels and so forth. Systemic mycoses, we call that. And those 11, not the other 10, those 11 just happened to die of Alzheimer's disease. Is there a fungal component? You bet. And no neurologist in America can say there's not. There is. Okay, what is this folic acid, vitamin B9? What role does it play? Because as I showed you the last slide, the lower levels of folate, the more Alzheimer's we see. Let's delve in a little bit. This kind of blows people's mind. We are told to eat grains and cereals because we get folic acid from those foods. Folic acid or vitamin B9 inhibits fungus and has antifungal properties. It is used, and I don't like this word, it is used to fortify grain products like breads and cereals. So it's used to cleanse the grains of mycotoxins. And yet we're told to eat that cereal. Lots of folic acid, we put it in there. It's not a natural source, we put it in there. Because I think, and no harm, no foul to the food industry, they're not doing it on purpose. I think they know that when they mix all those grains with folic acid, people don't get the mycotoxins that are pretty common in our American grain supply today. Okay, that's what it's used for. Folic acid, the natural folate is found in spinach, asparagus, broccoli, grapefruit, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, beets, avocado. By the by, those just happen to be what? Phase one foods. Do we need our cereals and pasta if we're adding it to? Shh. It didn't come that way from the corn or the wheat growing in the ground. We add it to it, and now we know why, to cleanse those products, cleanse the grains of fungus and mycotoxins. It has antifungal properties. I don't think it's a dirty little secret. As a matter of fact, I don't think the people who make cereals and breads even know that. They just know to put some folic acid in there and get it ready and make it rise and send it to the market. But now you happen to know. Earth defects, folate, and fungus. Okay, the U.S. Public Health Service, big organization, the Center for Disease Control, bigger organization, recommend that all women of childbearing age, and by the way, the first two months of pregnancy, this is important, consume about 0.4 milligram or 4,000 micrograms of the supplement folic acid, vitamin B9, daily, to prevent two common and serious birth defects. You ready for this? Spina bifida and anencephaly. 
Both of these diseases are intimately linked to fungal mycotoxins. So when you're pregnant and you're eating a lot of corn and you're eating whole wheat products because your dietician says to, just think about this. But this wasn't a show about being pregnant and being void of folic acid. We now know the reason that you take more folic acid is so you don't get these diseases. And what are these diseases? Oh, they're mycotoxin diseases. They're fungal diseases. This was a show, not even about folate. This was a show, a segment within a show, about Alzheimer's. You take your stereotypical Alzheimer's patient, and they were probably on lots of antibiotics when they were younger. And they probably drank alcohol far too often uh, when they were younger. And they probably grew up in a moldy home, folks, and they probably loved pasta and pizza and beer and so forth. I think all of these contributing are contributing factors to a disease called Alzheimer's disease. Do we, oh, we don't know why it's there, but here's new drugs. Do we accept that? Or do we really take a stance to see if we can prevent it in the future? Just a thought. I used to get headaches all the time. A lot of you write in and say, what can I do about headaches? Well, let's see if we can go through a two or three strategies to help eradicate these. Number one, I like to stay hydrated but if you are just not the person that's gonna drink a lot of water, then number one, I would say, white willow bark. It's a natural product, it's what aspirin is derived from, and white willow bark is always at the top of everybody's list. Number two, curcumin. Curcumin is a spice that comes from turmeric, and it's very anti-inflammatory and does a nice job with headaches. And number three, you're gonna hate me for this one, it's called Sinus Buster, and it is made from red cayenne pepper. It is a nasal spray that you spray into each nostril, and at first it burns, but in a moment, the headache goes away. You'll love it. Those meatballs were killer good. Absolutely great work. Thank you, Lindsay. Now, fascinating, isn't it? I wonder if Alzheimer's, I feel cancer, I feel diabetes, I published on that. I wonder if Alzheimer's is yet another fungal disease. How could it not? I mean, it, it's amazing, folks. We really have to think our way through this. Thank you, Dr. Ann Louise Gittleman, the new fat flush plan. You know, when you get very near Kaufman's phase one diet, you really help people get better. Lots of new twists in this book. I think you'll really enjoy it. Thank you for honoring us by watching today. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.